Well, good morning, everyone. I am Carol Jesse, your host and co-organizer of Creative Mornings Baltimore. I'm so excited to be coming to you live this morning from the Teen Center at the Enoch Pratt Free Library Woo! in beautiful downtown Baltimore. Hey, hey. The ancestral land of the Skyway people. We are so glad for you to be here with us this morning. Um, before we get started, though, real quick, I want to say again that Black Lives continue to matter. Creative Mornings Baltimore is one of over 200 chapters around the world and we meet every month on the same theme and the same mantra that everyone is invited and everyone is creative. We are so excited to be teaming up with our friends at HASA. We have Maura here with us today providing sign language interpretation. We know that if we truly are going to live up to the mantra of everyone is invited and everyone is creative, we need to make our events as accessible as possible. Our Super sign language is generously underwritten by Eddie of Roland Park. Eddie of Roland Park, currently featuring monumental semi-annual jumbo shrimp salad sale through Sunday, February 27th. Eddie's famous shrimp salad on your choice of bread or wrap for $6.99 while supplies last. Details at eddiesofrollandpark.com. So, I know... Uh, Numbers are going down and we're over the pandemic and we're over attending virtual events, but here we are and we're so glad that you're here. I want you to really give yourself permission to be here right now. I know it's really tempting to try to multitask, try to get that other email out or you know do this, that, or the other thing, but really you deserve this time to just be here with us for like the next 45 minutes or so. I promise it's gonna be a good time and we'd love to see your engagement in the chat. So speaking of the chat, we have our lovely Creative Mornings volunteers, Anita and Arlene, joining us to engage with you on YouTube. <laughs> Everyone is welcome. Yay! 
It's just that we think of them as monuments because they're a monument to scale. And so trying to parse these two terms kind of held me up for a little while, trying to prepare what I'm going to say here today. Um, but the way I think we can kind of think of it is basically we tend to call things that we celebrate monuments, and we call things that we mourn memorials, of course. And generally speaking, everything that is a monument is also a memorial. But not every memorial is a monument. And I know there are exceptions, so please don't at me about it. I get it. Um, but the thing about unites kind of all monuments is scale. They got to be big. Um, and this element of scale has really kind of had an inverse relationship with my own work. Um, and I think that has to do, again, with my background, being around this kind of massive scale all of my life. Um, it never really, I guess, impressed me in that it was always kind of part of my background. And I think subconsciously, I began to, to some degree, rebel against this in my own work. During my apprenticeship, right around the corner from this monument right here, I spent a lot of time working at the United States National, or excuse me, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Again, of course, a building referred to as a memorial, because of course it is, but it is also of monumental scale. And most of the time when I was in there doing various kinds of stone carving work, I had an awful lot of time to think. Usually it was between the hours of 6 p.m. and 3 a.m. and it's pretty quiet in that place. But I spent a lot of time looking at the sculpture in there and it occurred to me that the sculpture was just so big and it seemed as though it was attempting to compete with the grandeur, the monumental level of this horrific event with scale. And that struck me as odd and basically impossible. How could one even attempt to represent something so massively horrible by scale? It's really impossible. So during that time, I got basically to thinking, you know, pipe dreams of what I would do, or I commissioned to make some kind of memorial that was meant to represent an event that was basically unspeakable and unknowable. So it occurred to me to, instead of trying to compete with it on scale, to bring things small, to try to represent the thing that was not there. And it really, it occurred to me, when you have an event as horrific as this kind of genocide, you're not just losing those who are lost in the moment, but you're losing an infinite amount of people, not just existing family trees, but whole swaths of family forests. So um, when I came here to Baltimore for graduate school at the Reinhardt School of Sculpture, it gave me this opportunity to experiment with this idea of trying to bring things small, confine the scale to a very humanistic space, and again, in this instance right here, kind of attempting to represent what was not there with the thing, in this case, of course. A child and the sculpture itself had a sound element that was the voices of, you know, kind of children overlaid, overlaid, and overlaid at an exponential rate. Um, now, I should also credit an artist, Liddell Moe, who came to MICA um, and was a critic while I was there in grad school, and she said to me, you know, while you're doing this, maybe you should just go really small, like ultra small. And so I thought, well, maybe I should also go small in terms of the concept. So that kind of led me to thinking in these little moments that were just my wife and I eating ice cream in front of the television. And, you know, that moment when even a person who's a non-sculptor gets to be a sculptor for a moment when they hold a spoon and they open up a container of ice cream. And if the refrigerator's not working super well, it's like really soft or they forgot about it because they left it on the countertop. And like that moment is important too. And so it was this kind of thinking small and a little bit differently about Monument to Memorial that I think ultimately led my work uh, to some galleries in DC, and then ultimately to the Smithsonian American Art Museum's collection, and in this building here, which is itself, of course, a monument. I mean, it has dedicated to art written right across the top of it, and I remember walking by this as a child. Um, but within that space, <coughs> my sculpture sits there, small and quiet, you know, obviously a memorial. It's an illustration of kind of my last visual memory of my father-in-law who, who passed away from cancer in the home. And so I think of that in terms of the artwork that I like as well. One of my favorite artists is Ron Muick. He's known for his monumental scale. He does ultra-realistic, humanistic, basically figurative work, but massive scale, 20 times normal. But the work of his that stuck with me the most were the smaller pieces, the pieces that I've been able to see in person uh, in museums in, in Brooklyn and in DC. And those pieces, the ones that he did under scale, were the ones that resonated with me the most. So I feel like that's the kind of direction I've worked towards myself. Uh, and basically also how I kind of pick, um, I think I pick my concepts. Now, one of the main questions asked by Creative Mornings was, what will you bear witness to what will you leave behind? And those are certainly things I think about when I'm choosing 
uh, my subjects, I tend to gravitate towards things that I think should be monumental, things that I think people should care about, but I think are maybe overlooked. And I think there's like a misconception about stone carvers that because we work in a media that's considered to be traditional, even though it's not older than painting, um, people think that we're kind of stuck in the past, we're leaning on antiquity, but I think that stone carvers are actually far more futurist than people give us credit for because we're thinking about what's something going to look like in 500 years, not what were they doing 500 years ago. So when the place we're sitting in right now is at the bottom of the ocean, you know, we're wondering what the aliens are going to pull out of the silt. Yeah. And I bet it's going to be stone sculptures. So in this case right here, again, I'm trying to represent the undefined space between two people. So really, I've kind of moved away from the figurative, moved away from like, I don't know, the monumental nature of the figurative work and trying to sculpt again the space between, in this case, a parent and a child and a series of things I kind of think of as atrocity memorials where this is speaking specifically to the horrific events at the US-Mexico border when basically there was a policy that was an intentional and punitive just to be mean and horrifying to separate parents and children. And how could I represent that in a way that wasn't specific to people but more generally understood and that might be understood over time if you didn't have context to it. So hopefully people look at this work hard and they will maybe notice the impressions at the bottom foot of a child's finger and the impressions in the upper ear of a parent's hand. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. But the event seemed monumental to me and people didn't seem to care or didn't seem to be ashamed in the way that they ought to. Because we're not very good at making memorials in real time to things that we're ashamed of. Likewise, a lot of people don't really know what these words have in common. But this was like, I thought, a really massive event during the prior administration. And granted, there was an onslaught of news pretty much every day, but this was kind of this first real instance, a toe in the pool of attempting to change language. These seven words were handed down to um, the CDC and the HHS by the executive branch of the government, basically suggesting don't use these words. If you want our money in your congressional justification funding form, forms, don't use these words. And I think it's very easy to read between the lines and see exactly whom they were trying to disenfranchise with this. And it struck me that this should be a massive story. Why are we not all talking about this? But it kind of went in and out of the news very quickly. And so beyond attempting to just mark the moment and set the words in stone, of course, um, I thought it made the most sense to try to bring this into a place where people could actually physically touch it, use this as basically a method of printmaking. The stone itself used to be part of a printing press. And so now it can be used basically to make rubbings of these things. So it's not just a matter of preserving the words that somebody tried to take away, but really propagating them, moving them to space. But again, still keeping the scale intimate, um, but certainly something that I don't think is probably gonna be commissioned. And that's again, another thing that kind of goes into my thinking behind the work that I choose is, people aren't gonna pay me to do this. People are not gonna commission these things. It's very unlikely somebody is going to commission a portrait of a person that they are basically not in agreement with. So the idea of commissioning an antithetical or an antagonistic portrait of a person to make a memorial to, say, colossal folly and malice, it's pretty unlikely. But again, keeping the details very dense, keeping things on a humanistic scale, keeping it small, especially the hands. <laughs> but this preoccupation with size has kind of been ever present in my career. People ask me all the time, the most common question I get is, what's the biggest thing you've ever done? That and lasers. People ask about lasers a lot. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have lasers. <laughs> but I wonder why, you know, does size matter? How big is big? I don't know. This is what's in my studio right now. And it's not bigger than me, or at least it's not taller than me. But what does big mean? Does it mean height? Does it mean volume or area? Does it mean weight? I mean, when I started on this, it was 750 pounds. Is that big enough? You wouldn't want to drop it on your toe. Um, so uh, this has been always something that I haven't quite you know, fully understood, but I like this size. I like it to be personal. Um, now, monuments, of course, sometimes they do need to be viewed afar, and that's okay. A couple years ago, I was invited by Nick Benson, uh, and if you're not familiar with who that is, you should Google him right now, um, but to be part of the carving team at the Eisenhower uh, Memorial in DC. And we would ultimately carve over 4,000 letters into the walls of this memorial. And again, it's called the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial, but it is definitely a monument. It's half a city block right across the street from the Air and Space Museum. It's several stories tall. 
It's got a public bathroom and a gift shop. It is a monument. Um, and again, that's okay. It bears standing ba away from a little bit because that's the way you can take these in things in. You know, say what you will about Dwight D. Eisenhower. He had some very prescient things to say about the growth of the industrial complex and basically what its future implications might be. We're really seeing all that right now. Um, but what I would hope is that people don't just stop there. They don't stay far away. Go beyond just getting the selfie or pretending you're holding up the Washington Monument. Look a little deeper and, and realize that there were teams of construction workers and artisans and carvers in these places. They made memories. You know, I will never forget carving the name of the 34th president into this stone column while literally right over my shoulder, I could see the building where the 45th president was being impeached while I was listening to it on the radio. It was kind of surreal. Um, I got to every day wake up at 4.30 in the morning, take the train from Baltimore's Penn Station to DC's Union Station. I got to work with the greatest carvers in the country. Um, it was hard work on site by 6 a.m carving back on the train by 3.30, sometimes grabbing a kid on the way home and then doing it again the next day, six days a week for a few months. It was hard on my family, it was hard on my wife, um, but she really described it best when she said, basically, you went to carving camp. And it's true, I did. We had snacks, we had tents. Um, it was awesome, I loved it. Now, th that's why I wanna, wanna, I wanna share these photos and these stories so that people uh, understand this stuff is done by human hand, and I think that's really important in the way of seeing these things, looking close, understanding, again, there's people behind this stuff. People just assume they're done by robots or lasers. No, they're just, they're just done by us. Um, the running joke on site, uh, in a way, was that I was, I was born to do this project. The bill that funded this project was signed in 1999. I was still in high school in 1999, so the entirety of my professional practice, training, up to this moment was contained from the inception to the unveiling of that project. And I think that's, again, something important to notice. If you see a stroke of a letter and it looks beautiful, it's because it was designed that way. Somebody made it so with their hands. Somebody sweated over the idea of possibly breaking the edge off of a national monument. Me, that was me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, though, that every mark you see there, it's not just the work of the day. It's basically the culmination of the totality of somebody's professional career. All the skills that they built to the moment when their mallet hits the chisel, that's what that mark means. That's what you're seeing. You're not just seeing one strike, you're seeing everything that got them to the point where they could do that. Um, so there are years of preparation behind every bit of evidence of the human hand. So I would ask that the next time you're at a memorial, get up close, put your fingers in the inscriptions, feel that somebody's hands did that same thing once. Maybe somebody's son did that thing once. Um, we work very hard to make this, the people's work as good as it possibly can be. Um, so I hope that people look as hard as we work because that really makes it worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Kira. Let's see. Are we doing something with the TV now? I don't know. Maybe. Hi. Do you want me to change the <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to, to just like be sharing more about your work and more your practice and, and how you approach this theme. Um, we are getting into the Q&A part, y'all. So if you have a question, what you can do is go ahead and type it into the chat on whatever platform you're joining us from. So if you're joining us from YouTube, you can do a little comment there. Facebook, you can do it there. And then I will see it here on the screen. And then I can read it to Sebastian. And then we can have a Q&A, right? so cool. I'm just sitting close. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, shout out to, to Ellen and Local Color Flowers. Wait. <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? Oh. oh, you want me? <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, so, so um, I'll kick off this Q and A. So, one oh, okay. of the things that you had mentioned in your talk is about how one of the most common questions you get is like, "What is the biggest piece that you've ever made?" Yeah. Um, what do you have lasers, and where's the bathroom? That's usually, <laughs> what people ask me. Yeah. What is the smallest piece that you've ever made? So the smallest piece I've ever made was actually for a show here in Baltimore, the Creative Alliance. I 
can't remember the name of it. It was curated by Gary Kachdorian, but it all basically required the figures to be less than an inch tall. So when I was actually working on a different small ghost, meaning small, this small ghost, I made a, a one inch tall alabaster ghost. It was kind of like a study uh, for that piece. And it's this little thing you can hold it like literally in the palm of your hands. I think we have a photo of it. <laughs> <laughs> We're pulling it up now. It's so small, it's invisible. It's so small that we're having a hard time pulling it up on, on, on the slide. It's so tiny. <laughs> did, did we lose it? It's because Mario was looking for it. Oh. oh, jokes, jokes, jokes. We can't find it. Oh, sorry. We did have a photo of it. Anyway, it's very small. Imagine it. It's so small you can't see it, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll find it later. Oh, it's going to be so smooth, too. Anyway, you know how we roll here. <laughs> um, but what, so then another question that I have for you is like kind of something that was mentioned in your, in your bio and you touched on it a little bit, too, is that you often worked with salvage materials. Can you talk more, tell us more about that? Well, yeah, so kind of out of necessity initially, I began working with salvage stone because when I, again, came to Baltimore, it was for grad school. I was a you know, broke grad students. So the idea of purchasing stone was never a thing. And you know, I felt initially a little bit self-conscious about it because all these other sculptors that I would see images of, they're working with like the fancy stones, like you know, Carrara, Venetino, Calacata, Veneziato, and all this kind of stuff, like the fancy Italian names, like pretentious fancy Italian names. And um, <laughs> I was working with like Beaver Dam marble because that's what I could find here in Baltimore because that's what's kind of left over from parts of the city that have been raised. So that was initially just what I had to work with. And then over time, it actually, it became part of the concept of the work because I realized what I was really doing was upcycling in that I was taking something that had been thrown away and then making it into something that ostensibly, hopefully, was better than what it started out as, just a stair step, generally speaking. Um, and so that really became part of the concept of the piece, that these things had been discarded and was my subject matter in a, in some way, analogous situation. So, you know, again, it, it started out as kind of a negative, but now it's like a huge positive that stone is worth so much more. I can, now I can buy whatever stone I want, but mm -hmm. I choose to, to use the salvage stone in some cases because that's what makes sense with the concept of the art. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it definitely would go into like your artist statement of mm -hmm. like how you're, of like the, the subject matter that you're trying to do too. For sure. For sure. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so another concept that you talked about, touched on briefly in, in your talk that I would just love to hear you talk more about is like how Baltimore is the monument city or was the monument city? <laughs> yeah. Or? Is, I mean, was, is, I, you know, I guess it depends who you ask, but yeah, people don't realize that. But Baltimore, you know, historically had the, you know, basically this confluence of artists artisans, monument makers. Uh, the company that houses my st stone sculpture studio right now, Hillgardner Natural Stone Company, they were founded in the 1800s. So if it's big and it's stone and it's in Baltimore, it probably went through their doors at some point, but also DC, because again, people don't realize the vast majority of the marble in DC actually came from north of Baltimore. That's why Baltimore has all these white marble stair steps. It was just there. And so the Washington Monument in DC is this beautiful kind of striation of colors because it's the beaver dam marble which naturally has all these beautiful inclusions and stuff in it you know and it's a lot of people don't favor that stone as, as carvers i guess necessarily because it's it's not what they call clean meaning pure white sure. it has a lot of like natural color and character to it but i think that's what makes it unique it, what's what makes it interesting it makes it harder to carve because it's not consistent because it is basically diverse within its own matrix but it's much more interesting. I never want a piece of stone to just look like it had been cast in plaster. Um, so yeah, Baltimore's all, kind of always had this tradition. We have the oldest continually operational stone fabrication shop in the country, right where my studio is. That's what's up, Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> um, a question we have from Facebook is, um, your art is monumental. How do you discipline yourself to execute your monumental vision? Ooh. Not particularly well. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's tough. I mean, I, I, I'm not awesome about finding that like work-life balance. Um, it's difficult because the work does take a long time. And that's why I have to be like really selective about the stuff when I'm working on a piece that's just for myself because I'm essentially taking a vacation to do it. And again, I've been super lucky. It sounds like I'm complaining, but I'm not. 
but I've just got a lot of other larger projects that are kind of pulling me in various directions, so trying to balance them, trying to make sure I'm maintaining like basically my personal, my professional practice, and then my family. Sure. Uh, so that's, yeah, my, I guess my answer is hard and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that we have coming from YouTube is, uh, who currently inspires you and what artists are you following? Mm. So, I mean, I guess I'm following a lot of artists that are on my, and I mean, there's a lot of artists that inspire me. I think, you know, first of all, of course, when they say following, obviously we're thinking of things like Instagram and stuff. And so right now, I, myself and a few other sculptors, friends of mine, Alistair Thompson and I, another sculptor in Scotland, kind of jokingly started this like hashtag stone sculpture challenge thing just to start work. Um, and again, it started out as like a joke really, but what we realized is we're just kind of engaging with other stone sculptors of varying skill levels in a dozen different countries that are just all kind of interested in making work. And it was a way for us to like find each other and encourage each other and be inspired by each other's work. And so, you know, it just started out as Alasdair and I, and then Athar jumped in and then we, you know, kind of, it branched out from there. So that's like really inspiring. But in terms of the work that I look at, I mean, it's, it's all kind of, you know, different people there's and a lot of it's not it's not like I'm just only looking at stone carvers and stuff you know um, I have like Ron Muick um, Patricia Piccinini's work is amazing these kind of hyper real but also fantastical things that don't exist are always really interesting to me and um, so yeah I mean I guess it, it could be you know really anything that just strikes me at the moment do you listen to music when you are sculpting or working or podcasts or like silence what's your what's the set the scene for us <laughs> All of the above. Um, I, I, whatever I listen to, it's not what they show in the movies when there's like a stone sculptor at work <laughs> in a romantic studio and there's like beams of light and dust like floating through it and then they have like one gigantic hammer and a massive chisel and they go tink and then it's done. I don't, I don't listen to the classical romantic music. I'm generally, if I, I listen to, it's true, I do listen to like a lot of podcasts and stuff like that. Um, but in, in general, in terms of music, I'm listening to like, <laughs> like rock or punk, you know, or I'll just open up, you know, Amazon Music and type in like social distortion or something like that or Led Zeppelin and let it decide what I need to be listening to at the time. Because I think people, again, they have this perception that we're like so classical and traditional and conservative and it's really totally the opposite of that. You really want to be moving. Um, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's something to keep my blood flowing, I guess. That makes sense. Something to, to match the excitement that I have from like breaking the material. Uh, so another question that we have coming from uh, Facebook. So um, you're inside the monumental Enoch Pratt Free Library. Mm -hmm. What emotions and creative feelings do you feel when you enter a place like the Pratt Central Library? Well, I'm thinking this restoration is so good. You know? <laughs> I haven't gotten out a lot in the last couple of years. Sure. So uh, this is the first time I've really been able to come in and see it. And I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Like, obviously, the moldings and stuff in the ceiling are amazing. But the, the Enoch Pratt Free Library's central branch here, it has like some of the best examples of like really beautifully book matched marble. If people don't know what that is. That's like where you're cutting slabs out of a single block and folding them almost like origami so that the natural veins in them all match up and create these patterns. Like, Next time you walk through the stairwells here in the main entryway, like, look around at the walls. It's, it's really impressive. So I know in your bio it says that you did your, your bachelor's in illustration and then you went to grad school for sculpture. So mm -hmm. what was, what, when did sculpture enter your life? <laughs> it's weird. Um, so basically, well right from the jump, truly, I got to do some stone carving for the first time when I was 16 in high school uh, during what's was referred to as or is the Virginia Governor School Program. So it's like something you apply to for a summer and you get to go work in a particular discipline for um, you know, an extended period of time. And it's fully funded through the public school system, which is awesome. Um, but really, intellectually, I jived more with the illustration program, but I took all of my electives in sculpture at Syracuse. And they didn't really allow a double major with an art at that time. And then when I was there, I left for a while and went and I studied in Italy through their program. And that's when I was really seeing this stuff for the first time. I was like, I want to do that. I want to figure, I want to figure that out. I want to know how that is done. And so I came back to the States when I was still an undergrad and got a job at a stone shop. So what is your favorite medium to, like, of stones? You've like mentioned them. I know nothing about that. So, <laughs> so like, what is your favorite? 
stone or medium to work with? Um, you know, it really depends. I think I do tend to favor, you know, marble. Um, because it, it carves well, it can work well, it has a lot of variation in it, which is cool. I, again, I like the stone that I work with to have veins in it. You know, I, I'm one of those people, if it's, if it's flat, if it's clean, meaning clear, not containing that color information, I'm not as interested in it. Um, so, but having that lighter tone allows you to make the most of light and shadow. So I do tend to like, you know, that, you know, what people think of as, you know, traditional marble. Um, but uh, I can tell you what I like the least is sure. <laughs> like all carvers. Like <laughs> if I'm going to carve granite, you know that's going to cost you. Um, or other more denser rocks. I did something recently, some really large. It was a started out as boulder. It was about two and a half tons, and it was made out of a particularly dense stone, and that was really hard. But it made my appreciation for going back and then carving marble. All of a sudden, I was like, oh man, this is like butter. It's like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that probably marble, and I, like I said, I do like carving things where, you know, some of the pieces, it, it, also because I know stuff about them. Like, I know that the piece that Sean took photographs of in my studio is hanging up on the wall. Like, that used to be part of Johns Hopkins University. Oh, don't tell them. Um, <laughs> oops. <laughs> it's just you and I, right? Yeah. Um, so have, having that history or knowing that the piece of stone that I'm carving, something that refers to one of my children, was a stone that I pulled out of like a block in my neighborhood when they raised it to the ground. And they tried to like throw away the white stair steps. Like, ha so having that history to it, I think that's kind of what makes each piece a little bit special to me now. The, the block I'm carving right now, I got it from the stone shop where I was an apprentice. And when that, when that shop shut down a while ago, like I went and I took these blocks from the space when they were getting rid of stuff. So it's like that has a history. So I guess maybe that's my favorite kind of stone to carve is the stone that I have like a, a, a personal relationship with, which sounds strange when I say that. But. No, no, love it. Following, picking up what you're putting <laughs> um, If you have another question out there on in YouTube and, and Facebook land, we'd love to hear it. Is there, are there any questions in the room, too? No, there are. Yeah. Do you want to? Oh. Denise, get back over here. Take this microphone. Ask your question. <laughs> um, my question, you talked a lot about not necessarily doing commissionable pieces. Mm -hmm. So how do you really fund your work and buy all of your marble? <laughs> <laughs> well, good, so in terms of funding it, I, I don't. So that's the thing that I think, I'm sorry, I don't know which other issue. So, so basically, when I'm working on something that isn't commissioned, it's just mine, the thing that I basically have to understand or explain to say to my family is that I'm taking an unpaid vacation for this period of time that it takes me to make this thing. Now, it's possible that thing will, you know, go somewhere, it'll be in a gallery. You know, I recently, a gallery here in Baltimore, Catalyst Contemporary, took a few of my works to Miami. They did a great job. They sold some things that I never thought would sell, but I didn't know that when I made them. I have no anticipation or expectation that I'm gonna sell those things necessarily. So how do I fund it is basically being able to charge enough for my commissioned work to more or less underwrite my uncommissioned work. So that's just the stuff that I'm doing, things that I know that no one in the world is gonna ask for, me for some of these things that I've done, because why would they? They're either horrific or they're ugly or they're, you know. Um, so basically that's, that's the way. It's like I don't really have a way to fund those things um, other than basically just stealing time in my own shop to do that, which I'd say the last two years has been the hardest ever to do that because everybody's time has been, you know, so basically decimated. Um, and I had another question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you showed the carvings that you were doing over the summer, that mm -hmm. monumental piece. Right. Um, what happens if there's a mistake? Oh, you like, don't make you mistakes. You don't make mistakes. <laughs> 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 Is it like, oh, I chiseled too hard and now the whole thing's broken? Like, no, I, I mean, it, <laughs> not to sound like a total asshole. Sorry. Um, but uh, when I was an apprentice, my boss, uh, Tim Johnston, one of the things he would say to me is like, look, go slow, take your time, don't make any mistakes. Because sometimes, well, in that instance, you know, if I'm carving a part of, say, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, and if I do something wrong, there's no replacing it. 
it, even if you could replace the stone, you're never going to replace 150 years of weathering. So you've got to be really deliberate about that. So um, basically, we're very careful. The idea of measuring twice and cutting once is extremely relevant in my line of work. So I'm, I, I truly am, with that kind of commission work, extremely careful about what I'm doing, uh, which I think sucks my ability to be extremely careful in almost everything else in my life. I'm kind of like a mess and a klutz, generally speaking. Um, just, just ask Amanda. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, it's truly, yeah, but planning a lot. But which is why with, within my personal work, I don't do that as, as much. The stuff, the stuff I'm working on right now, I may not be using a pointing apparatus or doing as much measuring or calibrating of things because you know, it, it may not seem that way, but I'm like, I'm being spontaneous when I'm carving this particular thing because I don't have to worry about if, if I mean, it's true, if something goes wrong, then I gotta get another block of stone. But it's not like you know, some governmental agency or the Archdiocese of New York is gonna come down on me about it. So, yeah, right, you know, so, and that involved, well, an awful lot of proofreading needs to be done too. And, and that's something that gets checked way before. Um, so, so as far as I'm concerned, if the stone carver didn't do the design and the layout, they are not responsible for any typos. And that's a whole other <laughs> lecture and tour about DC and infamous <laughs> mistakes and things, because they're there. And in fact, the first work I ever did for the company, Hillgartner, that houses my studio now, was fixing a typo. I was in grad school and I was looking for stone, we got in touch, but they had, there was a typo in the American Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame wall. Oops. <laughs> and so, um, you know, again, because I had had, not because I was an art student at MICA, basically, despite that, <laughs> they were like, do you have training in fixing this kind of stuff? And because that was part of my apprenticeship, that ability to carve letters and the ability to do restoration work. Basically going in and taking a chunk of this wall out and replacing it with stone and recarving the name as it was meant to be spelled. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we have some more questions from, from the internet. So, Hike over at, on YouTube said, um, do you ever take on work that you don't want to because it makes sense from a business financial perspective? Or you're at a point in your career where you can be very selective with your commissions? Well, yes to both of those. Um, I mean, there are certain things that I are, you know, I kind of look to because I know they may be, I guess, financially good. I think in a way, more than anything, it's, I've been selective about the work that I do because I think that I've always, if I had one, I don't know if I'd call it a talent for business or career building, it's kind of being able to build off one thing off the next. Knowing one job puts me in a position to do another job, to do a better job, to do a better project, a more interesting project, to get more space with it, to get more design control, to get more freedom and autonomy, and then being kind of selective to some degree about the work that I do. Um, but then also understanding that I'm a professional, and then I work with other people that support me, and there are, you know, for instance, other stone companies that have work that come through them, and you know, I need to fulfill that role for maybe some work that doesn't like truly inspire me because it's, it's allowing me to be in the position I am, to do the work that really moves me. So I think the idea of saying, well, I'm gonna be completely purist about something and not focus on the, this work that I, I don't wanna do that stuff, I'd just rather do my own work, that's not really a very mature way to look at it. You know, If I only did work for projects that were, I guess, fully interesting or clients that I completely agreed with, <laughs> um, I might find myself with a lot more spare time on my hands. But, uh, I mean, that said, it's, pretty, it's true that my work is, is pretty interesting. It's, it's pretty rare that I'm doing like the exact same thing over and over again. Great. Um, Laura is asking on YouTube, uh, do you keep any sort of archive of the histories of the stones that you work with? For example, if um, you weren't there, would somebody be able to find out the story or personal interest behind the stones? Uh, I think you may have just made a new section on my website. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> I didn't think about that. No, I mean, not, not really. I guess people kind of just have to take my word for where it came from. Um, no, I think I've got like maybe some, photo actually, well, kind of. I do sometimes just have photographs of stones where I've seen something like a construction site. I'm like, I'm gonna go back and get that. or. But I don't, I haven't really, uh, I haven't documented it very well. And it's, you know, it's, it's funny, this came up with, of course, 
the Smithsonian because nobody documents like a museum. And I remember them asking me questions about where the stone came from. And I was like, well, you know, is this area of the woods in Druid Hill Park? <laughs> and they're like, well, what? and then it was something on it or something. They're like, what is it? I'm like, I don't know. It could be bird poop. It could be blood. I don't know. It's something about it. I don't know. So I don't, yeah, the provenance of the stones is like, I guess maybe a little bit dubious because I don't, I don't have any good way of documenting that. I, I think maybe I write stuff down about it sometimes. But no, sorry, not as well as I probably should. It's fine, fine. Um, a question coming from Facebook. What advice do you have for an inspiring artist, like a photographer who needs to do an apprenticeship, but also mm. is um, impatient about showing the world her own work? Mm. Well, <laughs> well, if you're, I guess the, the question is if you're, so trying to get a, a, basically get a job, that is the thing for sure. Uh, and get a job that in some way relates to what you're wanting to do. So I didn't really go into this, but I probably should. You know, the my apprenticeship, it sounds really romantic, the idea of being an apprentice and stuff. And I, I worked in an amazing place, but I polished miles of kitchen countertops, thresholds, bathtub surrounds, <laughs> staircases, moldings, columns, benches, fireplaces, mantle, like, not super interesting stuff. So you've got to do those boring things because, I mean, we've all seen The Karate Kid. It's very wax on, wax off. <laughs> By the time you're used to doing that, everything becomes second nature. Now it's, it's not a flex to basically feel like the stone can be malleable. So whatever work that would inform her practice, that's the work to find. You know, and it might be, and I don't, and as it applies to photography, I'm not really sure, but something that can in some way enhance the work that you want to do. And they'd be willing to do the work that you want to do in the hours you're not at that job. You know, I was at the stone shop, but I pretty quickly gained the support of the team there, and they basically let me have access to the shop. So I would go there, and I was there at work by 7.30 in the morning, but I was also staying till 8, 9 o'clock at night, working in the stone yard on my own things because they were not going to let me sit around and work on my own work on their time, generally speaking. They had work to do. Um, so it's being willing to put in that time, which is why, I mean, it's, it's lucky I did it when I did, when I was young, when I didn't have responsibilities, when I didn't have children. Now I have no time. The <laughs> idea of doing that is, is much more complicated. Uh, we have another question coming from YouTube from April. I watched a video of you carving with a pneumatic chisel. I might be saying that word wrong. You got it. Uh, how does working with these tools affect your physical body? Oh, well, not so far, I guess that's the short answer. Uh, it's true, I do have like pneumatic air hammers which basically hold chisels, so it's like a miniature jackhammer. And I think, but it, it's true, it's something I think about you know, more as I guess I, I get older, but those pneumatic tools, they really make the process go faster, but you've gotta be very careful with them because can, things can go wrong. But it's also a matter of knowing how to work with the tools, how to work with your body in a way that you're, there are ways to do it basically wrong. And I've talked to other older stone carvers and some of them have flat out said, oh, I was doing this all wrong, I screwed up this or that. So I try to be very conscious of that now. Um, so while it's true, as, as Mario pointed out the other day, I don't work out. <laughs> I should, thanks Mario. That was very <laughs> yeah, he didn't point it out, he just asked. Um, but <laughs> but I, I, I try to be more conscious about what I'm doing and how, li physically, literally, how I'm holding things. There are, are better and worse ways to hold things, and I realize that also allow the tools to do what they do. Allow them the, the ability to, to use their strength uh, as opposed to relying completely on yourself for it. You know, I mean, people ask me all the time, like, do, do, do you work out? Do you need to work out? And, like, the thing is, Stone carving is much more about finesse than about force. You don't need to be physically strong necessarily. I mean, there's a lower threshold, of course, but it's really more about carving smart as opposed to like carving strong, because that can just get you, you know, with a broken stone <laughs> or, or a broken body, really screwing something up. So having to be more conscious of that now and kind of um, being very aware of like, wait, I don't really need to hold this this way or grip this so hard or I can adjust basically where I'm moving or turning as I uh, work my way around a, a piece in a way that is going to be, you know, think of those, those little pneumatic things they are striking. They're almost vibrant. It's like, oh, this could be like a hand massager. I could take advantage of this to like really uh, work out some of those knots. <laughs> 
multi-purpose. Right. Um, we have another question coming from YouTube. David asks, how do you adjust to carving wood in the pews of St. Patrick's mm. Cathedral? Oh man, it's like a nice change up. Um, yeah, so I think a lot probably of stone carvers are also wood carvers. It is a very different headspace though. Um, stone carving, wood carving, they are conceptually the same in that you're taking stuff away or creating neg negative space. Um, but I guess I really should say that the physicality of it is totally different. The chisels are totally different. Um, the motion is totally different. With wood carving, you're slicing. With stone carving, even though we call it cutting, you're technically crushing. You're always breaking something. You're breaking a crystal. So one side of what you've done stays. Another side completely disappears. With wood carving, you're slicing through things. So it is a very different space. Um, but honestly, it's like very you know, meditative and you know, silent too, which is very different from most of the work that I do. Which, so I've got a lot of you know, excellent ear protection for those things. But it's nice to be able to sit you know, quietly and do something as opposed to um, having the, the intensity of that noise from the stone carving all the time. Definitely. A question coming from Facebook. Are any of your children into art, specifically carving? Uh, yes and kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so they're definitely uh, into art. I mean, our youngest is four, so he's just into everything. Um, mm -hmm. And But our oldest is nine, and so he definitely is into art, and he is, he's probably even more, like, in a way, meticulous and hard on himself than I am with certain things. Aww. He's like, I can't draw this, I need, and, and his problem, he's like, I need reference. I need to get reference for stuff. And then, so he'll do this, and then he'll forget about the, the reference, and then just go on. So yeah, John Carlo, he's uh, actually a very um, apt uh, artist, and he, he's, it's, yeah, I'm thinking of, he did a self, uh, excuse me, a portrait of me a few years ago, and my wife were like, wow, that is way too accurate. Uh, it was very good. Um, so they are, but we're still hoping for engineers and doctors. <laughs> yes. Right? So how can people keep up with what you have going on next? What do you have going on next? What's the best way for people to, <laughs> to know about it? Well, I mean, obviously the easiest way to just see what's going on is through Instagram or uh, I go Facebook and uh, technically TikTok, I think. Uh, and that's just me at Sebastian Martirana, which is a mouthful, but it's very phonetic. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm simple and I just use my name for my handle and everything. So it's just at Sebastian you Martirana. Remember, it's yeah. up on your screen right now, y'all. Oh, right. <laughs> but um, in terms of what's going on next, I mean, there's uh, a few projects that, you know, there's always stuff in DC and there's always things that I, I can't really uh, talk about. But there will be more work in DC. Um, as far as the work that I'm working on right, right now, I do have, uh, like I said, this commission that I'm working on at this moment. Uh, that, that particular sculpture is actually commissioned work based on some of my sculpture, other uh, other sculpture that I have done. Thanks, Tom and Maria. And so, in addition to that, there's some work that I'm doing in various kind of kind of historic cemeteries. I'm doing some work over in Greenmount, right here around the corner from us. I'm doing work with the Oak Hill Cemetery in DC, which is like one of the most historic, beautiful um, kind of uh, resting places in the world, really. Um, and I've got, yeah, that's, that's kind of all I can say now. I will have some work uh, <laughs> up in a show later this year at um, Catalyst Contemporary. And so there's some, some work there if people want to see some things in person, or if they you know, really just dine to do a studio visit, they can reach out to me and we'll probably set that up. Cool, very good. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Sebastian, for spending time with us and talking to us about Monumental. Thank you. Um, we, we loved it. And we are now going to give you um, at home a selfie opportunity uh -oh. with Sebastian. So, Sabina, if you could do the tight on Sebastian, you're looking at the camera where John is. Uh, nobody so, if you want to smile, and then Mary is going to take a live selfie in the room. <laughs> Tag us, tag Sebastian. We'd love to see what it looks like this morning where you are. <laughs> uh, so thank you, thank you again. Thank you. thank you so much. Um, at home, we want you to go ahead and please save the date for Friday, March 25th, where we'll be meeting on the theme of folklore. And then let's just close it out as we've been closing it out. So let's do three collectives deep breaths together. So, all right, sit, stand, be comfortable, however you wanna be, close your eyes, don't, let me, you know, live your life. Um, all right, so we're gonna breathe in. And out. In. And out. And one more time, in. And out. 
Thank you so much for joining us. We know that this doesn't replace the in-life experience, but we hope that you still feel part of this community. Have a great Friday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.